Welcome to the Mount St. Helens Visitor Center. Thank you so much for joining us down here in Southwest Washington. My name is Alyssa Adams and I'll be your park ranger today and I'd like to invite you on a virtual tour of this facility. Now, we're the first stop along the way to the mountain out on the Spear Lake Highway and this location has a lot to offer. Oh, do you wanna come inside? Well, before we get started, let's talk about proper museum etiquette. A few things to keep in mind before you come and enjoy the inside. Number one, please, no food or drink. Number two, please use shh quiet voices. Whoa, look at that! And number three, please no running in there. And remember to respect the space of those around you. focused and there's a certain order you want to take it in. I'd probably start in the theater to watch the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. Right this way. Then I'd go to the pre-eruption history section. The chronological timeline of the buildup, eruption, and aftermath right over there. and the biological recovery section at the end. Oh, and don't forget to check out the beautiful carved columns right behind you. They depict scenes of the Mount St. Helens area. As you can see, our visitor center has quite a comprehensive set of displays, and most folks spend up to an hour going through. But today, we're gonna take the quick route. And by the way, Feel free to pause your video anytime you want to read an exhibit or look at a photo. Yep, it's that time. Let's sneak on into the theater. I want to show you my favorite part. Come on! Right this way. You can come and sit with us. It's about to start. Well, here we are in the first exhibit gallery. Let's start by understanding where we fit on planet Earth. This is us right here, Mount St. Helens. We are one of many, many volcanoes on planet Earth. It's a big place. Each of these represents a volcano. And Mount St. Helens is one of 13 Cascade Range volcanoes. Once long ago, our planet was a supercontinent called Pangaea. Eventually, the land began to move and break apart through plate tectonics. Nowadays, it resembles a puzzle where the pieces once fit together. 
Let's have a demonstration. During that process of movement, subduction zones are formed, and sometimes earthquakes or even eruptions happen as a result. Believe it or not, the plates are constantly moving, grinding, sliding, and colliding past one another. Even right now as we speak, it's slowly happening. Wow! Here's another way of looking at that. Let's say you have two plates. You have your land plate or your continental plate. Then you have your ocean plate, like this one over here. And this plate's very heavy and dense and it sinks and pushes against the land plate. And as it pushes, a ridge line forms. And that ridge eventually creates a mountain range, such as Mount St. Helens, a volcano. At those sites called subduction zones, the rocks partially melt to form magma. Let's recap real quick. Subduction zones form, mountains build, and magma is created. On our planet, most volcanoes occur in chains, like giant beads on a string, or in this case, a pipe cleaner. These 13 beads represent the Cascade Range volcanoes. The yellow one is Mount St. Helens. The Cascade Range of volcanoes forms a semicircle around the Pacific Ocean, and we call that the Pacific Ring of Fire. It looks something like this, and Mount St. Helens is a part of it. Can you see the yellow bead? Let's go check out the next exhibit. In these exhibits, you'll learn all about life before the eruption, but not just the 1980 event, because this mountain is rewoken time and time and time again. Across this landscape, there have been many people living and working, and these displays are going to showcase their unique perspectives. The Native American people, explorers, miners, forestry, and recreation. Let's take a look. One of the favorite features here are our ash figurines. This one seen here is a Kellis tribal member picking berries. We have a Pacific Northwest fur trapper, a miner from the Spirit Lake Basin. Over here is a summit climber of Mount St. Helens and an early day Forest Service Ranger. For the native people, the knowledge of the Pacific Northwest has been passed down from generation to generation with natural events reflected in their legends, lifestyles, and local names. The Cowlitz, Klickitat, and Upper Chinook have lived around Mount St. Helens for centuries. They used the abundance of resources that the mountain had to offer and continue to do so today. Many of their traditions focus on the mountain as it was and still is an important part of their lives and culture. The non-native explorers arrived in waves later, with Captain George Vancouver sailing the Columbia, the Lewis and Clark expedition venturing overland, trappers and traders enticed by resources, and homesteaders descending along the Oregon Trail. The exploration of Mount St. Helens has provided many with economical, recreational, and educational opportunities. In the 1800s, nearby Fort Vancouver was a central hub, and the Hudson's Bay Company sent fur trappers to the wilderness around the mountain. Even back then, folks climbed Mount St. Helens, with the first recorded summit in the 1850s. Discoveries made at the mountain long ago are recreational features enjoyed today. With the discovery of gold specks in the nearby Lewis River, excitement was elevated, and the search continued. Mines were painstakingly excavated, and shares of stock were sold to propel the business forward. Industry and settlement of Mount St. Helens has always prospered, with homesteaders drawn to this area with the hopes of discovering copper, gold, and silver. A growing population required the establishment of local businesses, and a community soon formed. Ore mining was abandoned when discoveries were few and timber quickly became the new gold. Logging camps were built, wood was sent to mills, and more families settled in the area. Logging became the way of life in Cowlitz County. Local forests were becoming a valuable asset, and Congress took a step toward conservation by establishing the United States Forest Service. They acted as caretakers for the land, protecting the resources from fire, theft, and poaching. After the mining and logging operations of the early 1900s, Mount St. Helens became more easily accessible, with roads offering a variety of recreational opportunities within the Gifford-Pinchot National Forest. 
Spirit Lake at the base of Mount St. Helens turned into a very popular destination. With campgrounds, resorts, and summer camps available, it was a home away from home for fishing, swimming, hiking, and snow play. The Civilian Conservation Corps even built the Spirit Lake Ranger Station. Mount St. Helens was a natural draw for hikers and mountain climbers. The extensive backcountry offered trails for access to lakes, meadows, inspiring views, and old fire lookouts. Mountaineering clubs were formed and skiing and snowshoeing became popular. Access through Timberline at the base of the mountain was the way to go. Spirit Lake has long been a special place of beauty and tradition for both the Native American people and later avid recreators. Over the years, hundreds of thousands of visitors spent their summers frolicking along the shorelines. Accessibility became a driving force and creature comforts were soon introduced for children, adults, and families. The Native American communities around the mountain lived a hunting, fishing, and gathering lifestyle. Relying on the foods that nature provided during each season, they followed a movement pattern called the seasonal rounds. Spring, summer, fall, and winter each brought unique opportunities for harvest, which they collected traveling between ancestral sites. Let's head on over to the next exhibit gallery to learn about the 1980 eruption activity. Up high, Forest Ranger! In these exhibits, you'll learn about the buildup, eruption, and aftermath of the May 18th, 1980 eruption. There's a lot to read here, so I hope you brought your glasses. In March of 1980, it became apparent that Mount St. Helens was reawakening. This aligned with theories made in the 1970s that the volcano's behavior pattern suggested a possible eruption before the end of the century. After 123 years of dormancy and quiet, it was resuming activity in a very obvious way. The increasing unrest brought droves of scientists to carefully monitor the mountain and install additional equipment to help them understand what was happening. Earthquakes were the first warning sign. This sudden change caused avalanches, forcing the Forest Service to close the mountain on March 26. The following day, a phreatic eruption of steam and ash launched skyward out of the mountain, painting the pure white snow with streaks of gray. Meanwhile, the summit was cracking and a crater appeared. An official hazard watch was in place, signifying the seriousness of the situation. Emergency coordination was set up and the evacuation process had begun. By early April, a state of emergency was declared and preparations were made for possible large-scale eruption. Phreatic eruptions continued and a second crater ripped open and merged with the first one, resulting in a dangerous chasm. As the earthquakes drummed along, harmonic tremors were also recorded, a continuous rhythmic ground shaking caused from the magma, carbon dioxide, and water vapor moving beneath the surface. It soon became apparent that dramatic changes were occurring on the north flank of the volcano. A side conduit within the mountain was not venting properly, and the rising magma was beginning to build up. This area of swelling became known as the bulge, and it was growing at a rate of 5 feet a day, pushing outward and upward. The mountain was becoming unstable, the earthquakes were relentless, and avalanche danger was high. With continued monitoring in place to forecast eruptions, two hazard zones were designated around the volcano. Scientists and law enforcement personnel continued their work, and the public was encouraged to prepare to leave. Tourism became a booming business, and visitors came from all over the U.S. for a chance to view a real volcano. The urgency of the situation was not being heard. On May 17, residents with permits were escorted by police into the red zone, the area immediately around the mountain's peak, to gather their belongings. Ash covered everything, so they quickly packed and left, with plans to return the next day. As the sun set on Mount St. Helens on May 17, only a handful of people were known to be within the red zone. A tree planting crew, geologist David Johnston, lodge owner Harry Truman, and staff photographer for the Columbia newspaper Reed Blackburn. No one could guess what little time remained. The following day, May 18th of 1980, started as usual. 
To all appearances, it was a morning just like any other. But then, it happened. At 8.32 in the morning, a large earthquake shook the mountain and the bulge dropped, creating a massive debris avalanche. Tremendous power, pressure, and fury, it smashed into a ridgeline, dropped into Spirit Lake, and continued forward. The mountain was literally sliding apart. Explosion clouds ripped through the avalanche, quickly becoming a laterally directed blast of gas, ash, rock, and steam. This abrupt release of pressure caused the mountain to blow apart. Superheated groundwater flashed the steam instantly, and gases within the rising magma chamber suddenly expanded. The lateral blast toppled the nearby forest and carried away the trees. Within minutes of the eruption, lahars, a volcanic mud flow, traveled down all sides of the volcano. Heat within the blast melted the remaining snow and ice, triggering a flood of mud. The ash plume rose 15 miles upward, and pyroclastic flows of pumice, ash, and trapped air sped out of the crater, depositing rocks to the north of the mountain. People around the mountain never heard the eruption, but those many miles away heard a series of loud booms. Survivors heard a rumbling and roaring sound as a cloud of ash came upon them, but the dense mixture of air, ash, and rocks blocked the sound of shouting or falling trees. The ash plume rose and blew east, darkening the skies of eastern Washington. Massive flooding occurred, with the largest coming down the North Fork Toodle River. It traveled down the Cowlitz and eventually the Columbia, which rose 20 feet. This mud flow swept away everything in its path, vehicles, roads, bridges, and more than 300 homes. Interstate 5 was even closed for a bit. The monumental rescue and recovery efforts began immediately. Over 170 people were saved but 57 perished. On May 21st, President Carter declared the entire state of Washington a disaster area. As rescues continued, geologists worried. Their ongoing research revealed many possible problems. Rivers were trapped with debris and Spirit Lake was choked with material too. Eminent flooding downstream could be on the horizon. Another eruption occurred in late May, but fortunately, it was much smaller this time. The ash scattered all over southwest Washington and into Oregon, and pyroclastic flows sped down the mountain again. The large-scale cleanup and dredging of the rivers continued. Damage from this natural disaster was beyond measure, and the financial cost was overwhelming, with estimates in the millions and billions of dollars. By that summer, signs of life were already persisting. Just 20 days after the eruption, plants and animals were found in the volcanic area. Loggers returned to salvage as much blowdown forest as possible. Another eruption came in June, again smaller than the big event, but damaging nonetheless. The town to the south of the mountain was pummeled by pumice rocks, and pyroclastic flows surged once more, reaching up to a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. It was soon discovered that a dome was forming inside the crater. The thick lava grew an average of six to 10 feet a day, reaching 200 feet high. Scientists said this dome would one day be the new peak. This would continue from 1980 through 86. Volcanoes have always been important forces which helped to shape and form the face of the earth. While the eruptions caused a great deal of destruction, they also provided a unique opportunity to study firsthand not only the workings of a volcano, but the miraculous process of nature. These displays serve as a reminder of the intense heat and aftermath of the eruption. The ash and pumice became an ever persistent part of life. Here, you can see a model Mount St. Helens after the 1980 event. The crater and dome are that from the 1980 to 1986 dome building eruption. Now, since that time, we've had another eruption occur. So if you were to visit today, the mountain would look pretty different. In the forefront, you can see the pumice plain or the field of lava rocks. And over there are lakes and ponds made from the eruption.
Let's explore the belly of the beast. You got it right. I'm going inside. Come on with me. Here, you can see layers of rock material built from years of eruptions. Now, Mount St. Helens is what we call a stratovolcano. It's built upon layers and layers of itself. Sometimes when it blows, it actually grows as the material falls back down on top of it. Wow, take a look at this place. Do you smell or hear that? It stinks like rotten eggs. And I can hear the hissing, cracking sound from the liquid rock moving. Hey now, hey, I thought you don't make this hot. Let's get out of here. These before and after photos reveal the profound changes that took place that day. Both of these rocks were ejected on the Mount St. Helens in 1980. This one in particular, the pumice, came out during the main event. It was created from superheated magma with water and gas trapped inside. Essentially, as the gas bubbles escaped, little holes or pores were left on the surface. Now this rock, called Bayside, came a couple months later during the dome building series of eruptions. The outer crust was cooling, the inside was still hot and expanding outwards, and it cracked the surface. We call this a bread crust bomb because it resembles freshly baked bread. You know what do bombs do best? They explode in this rock with no exception. The ash was a far-reaching impact of the eruption. It traveled east and kept on going, eventually reaching 11 states when all was said and done. Some towns were covered by nearly three inches, while others only received a dusting. As the ash traveled around the world, so too did the news of the eruption, and it soon became the most highly publicized event in human history. <laughs> but it wasn't over yet. The recovery had just begun. Alrighty then, we're almost done. In this last exhibit gallery, you'll learn all about the natural recovery process after that eruption, as well as how scientists took a leading role in documenting every step along the way. Trees are timekeepers of natural disasters. An eruption can stress or injure a tree, causing the growth rings to narrow. Scientists study these rings to identify when volcanic activity occurred. The cross section of a ridgeline can reveal an incredible history beneath our feet. These layers of material represent a different chapter in the long history of eruptions and forest growth at Mount St. Helens. Here's an example. This layer of soil right here represents the thriving old growth of the Gifford Country National Forest, the recreational paradise surrounding Spirit Lake. This soil is a reminder of what happened, and here's why. There is an eruption, the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens. This essentially squished the forest. This is a layer of dacite rock followed by the pumice rock that rained down on top. Seismographs are an important tool used by geologists. They record ground movement, oftentimes recording earthquakes, which can be triggered by volcanic activity. Now this one is called a helicorder, and it's much like the one used back in 1980. Back in the day, it was all about pen and paper. This drum would rotate, and the stylus down here was hot it would burn a signature across the paper. Then volcanologists could translate that into a language we'd understand. Here's a seismic reading from the May 18th eruption. That day started out like any other. It was a calm morning, but then all of a sudden, it happened. At 8.32 a.m., there was so much activity going on, we lost our clean seismic reading that day, and all we could see was static. Soon, technology advanced, and more accurate digital devices were developed. Let's give this a try. I'm going to jump up and down and make an earthquake. Here I go. Hey, that's pretty good, but I bet I can do better if I had some assistance. Eager Beaver, come on and help me. On the count of three, we're going to jump together. One, two, three, and go. Wow, look at that. That's even bigger. Volcanologists use more than seismographs. 
Volcano monitoring involves a variety of measurements and observations designed to detect increasing pressure and stresses caused by the movement of magma or molten rock beneath it. Many techniques are used to determine changes in a volcano's behavior to anticipate impeding eruptive activity. Data collected by geologists during fieldwork in the crater is analyzed and compared with the records of past eruptions. These are some of the tools and instruments they use. Scientists didn't just study the volcano and inside the crater. Researchers began documenting the aftermath of the eruptive event, including the long-term effects on the rivers, lakes, and streams around the mountain, and the survival, recovery, and return of plant and animal life. Scientists were pleasantly surprised to discover that clusters of plants and animals actually survived the eruption. Because it blew in early spring, snow, ice, ground cover, and ridges protected the islands of life. Many critters such as pocket gophers, mice, weasels, ground squirrels, and ants burrow and tunnel underneath the ground. After surviving the eruption, they played a very important role in the initial ecological succession. They brought fungi, bacteria, and nutrient-rich topsoil to the surface, then mixed with the ash and created new fertile habitat. Many of the trees and shrubs were buried in deep snow and insulated from the searing heat of the blast. These plants pushed themselves up through the ash, dormant buds bloomed, and some of the plants that lost their roots sprouted new ones closer to the surface. Some plants that lost everything but their roots reappeared with stored energy. Hibernating critters such as salamanders, frogs, and crawfish bury themselves during the winter months, so they were safe underground in their little muddy layers. Many of the lakes were frozen and they suffered very little damage to their aquatic populations. Those fish would be back for another season of mosquito eaten. Not only was life found after the eruption, but biologists soon discovered complex interactions occurring between these organisms and their environment. Lupin flowers were producing nitrogen to fertilize the inhospitable soil, and the mycorrhizal fungi was beneath the surface, helping to enhance moisture uptake. This little interaction was providing habitat to other plants, animals, and insects, which set the stage for continued linkages of life. To this day, scientists continue to arrive from all over the world to study Mount St. Helens. This incredible landscape has become an awe-inspiring living laboratory. The ongoing research here adds to our understanding of volcanic, biologic, and successional processes. We have made numerous monumental discoveries since 1980, and this ever-changing land continues to inspire and surprise us. Let's quickly go over what we learned today. We saw the towering ash plume when we watched the monumental eruption in a theater. Explore the South Cascade Mountains, where volcanoes are located and how they are formed. Stepped back in time to experience life before 1980 and meet the people who called this area home. Witness the multi-month buildup, eruption, and aftermath of that big day. And learn that some people died while others were rescued. Safely investigated the inside of an active volcano and re-emerged to tell the tale. Experienced the astonishing changes through before and after photos. Studied the inspiring research and discoveries made by scientists. Created our very own earthquake and saw the ongoing recovery of this land. Thank you so much for joining us here today at the Mount St. Helens Visitor Center for our virtual tour. We hope you had a fun educational experience from the comfort of your home or classroom. I know that we had a blast. The next time you're in the area, feel free to stop by Sequest State Park to check out our hiking trails or hop across the road to Silver Lake to enjoy our boardwalk trail. And a final farewell and a huge thank you to our mascot, Eager Beaver, as he goes into retirement in style. Isn't that right, Eager? Let's go for it.
you know the museum is closed? Who let you in? Go home!